How many of you have heard about quantum computing? So yeah, probably like 50%. And how many of you have actually used a quantum computer? No one. All right. Let me begin by giving a motivation for why quantum computing is important. When you think about the challenges that financial research faces today, what are they? Well, most of the financial research that you find published in papers, in journals, it's uh, research that is not based, most of it, on direct experience, meaning that most academics do not have access to the only laboratory that exists for finance, which are the markets. Think of a physicist who has never been able to drop a ball and experience how gravity works. Or a physicist who is thinking about particles but has never had the chance to experience in, a, in an accelerator. So that's the situation in finance. It's a very big problem that most research is done without having the ability to reproduce an experiment by controlling the variables involved in that, in that experiment. For instance, what happened during the flash crash. We cannot reproduce what happened that day controlling the environmental variables and to try to understand what is the cause-effect mechanism. The second problem is models tend to be very simplistic. It's, we can argue why it could be a, a cultural phenomenon, could be a matter of uh, preference. But as a matter of fact, when you think about it, financial markets are very complex networks. They are much more complex than, for instance, climate or weather prediction. Because when you're trying to predict the weather, you have to model all these variables, but the variables are not reacting against you. They are not trying to learn what you are learning and acting in a different way to, to, uh, counter, uh, to, to produce a counter effect for countermeasures. So that's the second problem uh, that is typical in financial research. Models are way too simple for the kind of problems that we have at hand. And what is the implication? Well, the implication is that most research that appears in journals tends to be very simplistic toy models that are overfit on data. They are not experimental. They are empirical, but they are not experimental. There is a big difference between empiricism and experimentalism. Empiricism, you measure things. But in experimentalism, you actually observe reactions. You are able to act, and you see a counter-reaction, and you adjust your understanding, your hypothesis, based on the observations, on the response that the system produces to your actions. So, in the end, as the president of the American Finance Association um, has acknowledged, most research findings in financial economics are just false. Most of the stuff that you read in, in financial journals actually does not work. And, well, it's, it's something, it's, it's, it's not at all a controversial statement, you know, it's actually it's the president of the American Finance Association saying it. It's not a controversial statement. So what is wrong, and what can we do about it? Because finance, although it can be vilified, as a matter of fact, it has a purpose in society. We need finance to make decisions under uncertainty, to help people achieve their financial goals. What can we do about it? Well, the biggest problem is computational power. The models are simple because people don't have access to the computational power needed to solve difficult problems. So, for instance, at the, at the National Laboratory, I'm affiliated with the National Laboratory, if, if we want to predict weather, we use a supercomputer. And some of the largest and fastest supercomputers are at NERSC in, in national laboratories. Well, that's not the case in finance. So what finance needs in order to advance and to actually solve meaningful problems in a reliable way is a kind of machinery that 
other fields of science use to solve their problems. They're very hard problems. Like, for instance, the Large Hadron Collider. There is no equivalent to the Large Hadron Collider in finance. There is just not this sort of experimental setting or, or, or computational power. Well, quantum computing offers this possibility, or at least in that direction. It offers the possibility of having a machine that has an exponential computer power, exponentially greater computer power than digital computers. So what is quantum computing? Quantum computing is, you can think of it as a field of research first, and then, of course, there is an application, but it's a field of research where we develop algorithms that use the very basic laws of nature. In order to solve a problem, we use the laws of nature. So how does it work? It sounds something like strange, but in fact, it works. And we will see some examples. The field was inaugurated in the 1980s by uh, Benioff and the very well-known Nobel Prize winning physicist Richard Feynman. So Feynman, in 19, back in 1981, wrote a very famous paper where he made the following argument. Quantum mechanics deals with um, probabilistic problems. It deals with problems that involve probability and where the system does not reach some sort of deterministic solution. And yet, we are using deterministic machines, meaning the traditional binary-style computer, to solve probabilistic problems. It makes no sense. So what he proposed is to develop a new kind of computer device that would be probabilistic. It would not be deterministic, and that's what a quantum computer is. And everything came, you know, back in 1981, it was kind of, uh, I guess, science fiction or uh, a nice idea. But then, a mathematician back in 1994, Peter Shor, proved that it is possible, mathematically, to develop quantum algorithms, meaning algorithms that run in that quantum machine, that can crack code as a matter of as simply as you can do additions. You know, the, the a standard uh, procedure for uh, encryption these days is the RSA uh, protocol. Essentially, what makes RSA a very good encryption mechanism is that it poses a integer factorization problem that is very hard to solve by trial and error. So this is a very hard problem. It requires a traditional computer millions of years to run some calculations in order to solve a, a problem that is about to change in one minute, because within one minute you're going to get a new key. That's what gives encryption it's security. It poses a problem that can only be solved within millions of years, but you have a minute to solve it. Well, for a quantum computer, it's actually a matter of seconds to solve this problem. We can talk later in the Q&A session about the implications of that and how are we going to secure our bank accounts in a few years once quantum computers are able to get into our bank accounts as easily as you can use a calculator to compute the square root of two. How does uh, quantum computing achieve this sort of computational power. If you're familiar with supercomputers, you know that the interesting fact about quantum computers is something called parallelism. The, the holy grail of supercomputing is you take a problem, you chop it into pieces, and these pieces can be computed simultaneously, so a task that linearly would take hours, now it takes a matter of seconds, because you have many different threads, many different processes solving this problem all simultaneously. So that's really the magic about supercomputing. Now, in a traditional computer, this occurs, this parallelism occurs at the circuit level. You have multiple circuits solving this problem at the same time. In a quantum computer, what happens is something wonderful. There are not multiple circuits solving this problem simultaneously. There is one circuit, but the parallelism occurs at the logical level. You see, quantum computers don't work with bits. A bit is a memory item that can have 
a, a state of 0 or 1. So 2 bits could be in 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, or, or 1, 1. There could be in four possible states, 2 bits. Now, 2 bits hold two units of information. There are two spaces. They hold two units of information. But 2 qubits hold four units of information. Why? Because these four states, 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1, are in a linear superposition. This means that there are four coefficients that characterize the state of the system. Four variables to represent the information packed in two qubits. So how do we go from two to four? It is because qubits are in linear superposition. Now, if you have n qubits, this means that you can hold two to the power of n units of information. And there is where the exponential finance, <laughs> the exponential power of quantum computing comes in. With an n number of qubits, you can achieve, you can store the same amount of information as with 2 to the power of n bits, traditional bits. There is a second very important fact about quantum computers, and it is the way they solve problems. You see, when we take a traditional computer, let's say that we are playing a video game like Angry Birds, and you're going to shoot that bird over those pigs, right? What is the computer doing? Is solving a partial differential equations system. It's solving a mathematical problem that represents a physical phenomenon. Well, quantum computers work the other way around. They use physics to solve a math problem. It's the anti Angry Birds game. It's the game where you code a microchip to behave like gravity, and then you go and throw the bird and see where it falls. When you think about it, what is essentially powerful about this paradigm is that it replicates how the universe solves mathematical problems. There are plenty of very hard mathematical problems that the universe, nature, solves all the time for free instantaneously. For instance, what is called the n-body problem. To compute the trajectories of a gravitational system with n-bodies, where n is greater than 2, like for instance 3, is mathematically very difficult. It requires a tremendous amount of computational power. There is no closed solution. There is no analytical formula that you can just run to compute the trajectories. Well, for a quantum computer, to solve this system is easy. The same as it is very easy for nature to solve this system. In fact, it's solving it right now with our solar system. It's solving it with us. Nature is solving a tremendous amount an incomprehensible amount of mathematical problems all the time. And how does it do it? Using quantum physics. You can think of quantum physics actually as the most powerful computer that can be conceived. What is a quantum computer? Well, we are in a quantum computer because we are in the physical world and we are subject to the laws of quantum mechanics. The same that a quantum computer is subject to the laws of quantum mechanics. A quantum computer is just a way of changing the problem. It's asking nature to solve this problem for us. We change the, our microchip to represent a problem that is interesting to us. Of course, the gravitation of the solar system is very important, actually critical to us too. We, we want nature to solve that problem. In addition, we want them to solve some problems that are meaningful to us. But essentially, that's what it is. A quantum computer is a device that uses nature to solve a problem that is relevant to us. How do they look? Well, I, I place a photo there. You can see that essentially it's a very tiny microchip, very powerful, tiny microchip, that is sitting at the center of a fridge. It's a tremendous fridge that is, able, that is shielding this microchip of um, electromagnetic fields, and it's cooling the microchip to 
a temperature of 15 millikelvin, which is 180 times colder than interstellar space. You can actually think that the uh, quantum computer sitting today in Vancouver is the coldest region in the universe that we know of. <laughs> and definitely the coldest region of the universe uh, closest to us. Actually, it's pretty cool, right? What makes quantum computing somewhat, contro somewhat con controversial? Well, I guess the controversy, the controversy is waning, is disappearing, but, you know, um, until five years ago, many people um, in the physics community were very skeptic about the power of quantum computing and even the possibility of quantum computing, which now is kind of undeniable. And in fact, there are multiple commercial quantum computers available, multiple meaning like three. <laughs> I'm not saying like hundreds. <laughs> there is one sitting at uh, the NASA and Google laboratory. This quantum computer um, um, was used to solve a very uh, difficult problem last December, a problem that it, to a traditional computer it would have taken millions of years to solve. This quantum computer was able to solve it. Uh, there is another quantum computer uh, sitting at US, at University of, Calif University of Southern California, and it's owned by that university and Lockheed Martin. There is also, of course, uh, thanks to Edward Snowden, <laughs> we know that the NSA has invested at least $80 million uh, in developing quantum computing uh, cryptography. So we know that also that the NSA is a very strong player in this field. And um, in the end, you have to think of quantum computing as uh, um, it's a paradigm breaker and shifter. Of course, there will be opposition to it. Of course, many people would prefer that things stay the way they are. Um, there are plenty of tenured professors who would just prefer that people still find their topic attractive. There are plenty of companies that would prefer uh, that everybody keeps buying their um, slow digital computers. So there will be always very, uh, a tremendous amount of opposition to uh, what essentially are technological revolutions. Some intractable problems in finance. You see, quantum computing is um, not only cool, we saw how cool in fact it is, 150 uh, microkelvin, it's actually something that is useful. And I'm a portfolio manager, right? I manage several multi-billion dollar funds. I'm interested in quantum computing because it helps me. It helps me. It's something tangible. I, I can evaluate how much it helps me. It's real. It was not real one year ago. It's real now. How can it be used? It can be used in dynamic portfolio optimization. Optimizing a portfolio is trivial, kind of, when you do it on a one-step horizon. But what if you want to compute the optimal portfolio, the optimal trajectory of the portfolio over multiple rebalances? Now, that's an MP-complete problem. It's a problem that is very hard to solve for a traditional computer. It's not hard to solve for a quantum computer. And in fact, some colleagues and I published a paper uh, last year uh, in the Journal of Signal Processing where we show uh, how a quantum computer, an actual, real, <coughs> with a physical quantum computer, was able to solve a dynamic programming problem in its most, in its most general magnificent form. No dumping down the problem, no cutting corners, just throwing to the machine the problem Raw, no sugar coating, it just solve it. Now the problem is, of course, is, 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 is a small scale portfolio, but that doesn't mean that once we get larger supercomputers in a few years, we will be able to solve very large scale um, portfolio optimization problems. A second case, use case is a scenario analysis. How many times you hear in a board meeting 
the CIO saying, well, you know, our portfolio is well positioned to this scenario and that scenario. How many scenarios can he actually think of? 10, 15? But there are millions, billions of possible scenarios. How could we possibly code all these scenarios and evaluate them? Well, we cannot, but we can allow a quantum computer to use its power to simulate the portfolio under billions of scenarios. Number three, option pricing. Option pricing um, becomes problematic when you end up in path-dependent processes. There are no closed form, there, are, there is no Black-Scholes-Merton formula for um, path-dependent integrals and, op and very exotic options. But this sort of path dependency is not a problem to quantum computing, because quantum computers will evaluate a tremendous number of alternative outcomes and derive a price base on, on those. And then, one of my favorite examples is clustering. So what is a clustering problem? It's a problem where you are trying to put together things that are similar. And when you go into the dimension of 1,000, 10,000 uh, instruments, as I have in this plot, th this is a plot of a, a correlation matrix. It's a heat map of a correlation matrix with, I guess, a few thousand instruments. Well. To, to invert this covariance matrix is, is a lost case. It's going to be singular or nearly singular. It's going to be numerically ill-conditioned. The solutions that are going to come out of um, working with this covariance matrix is essentially is going to be garbage. But what if we use a clustering algorithm to reduce the dimension of the problem to a, to a manageable size? And that's what this algorithm does. Essentially, it, it took these thousands of instruments and, and it tells us, well, you know, in fact, you have like 10. 10 truly different instruments here. It took a big data, data, a big data set and it was able to shrink it to what is something manageable and something that can be solved in a robust way. And what we show in this, in the, we published a paper on this method, what we show is that, in fact, out of sample, this sort of solution delivers a performance that is 31% better than uh, the mean variance portfolio optimization method, which is, you know, Nobel Prize winning, very famous, very recognized, used by everyone in, in, in finance and in the profession. But as a matter of fact, what we show is that what was a mathematically exact solution in sample happens to be detrimental out of sample. This, there are solutions, when you solve an, uh, an optimization problem, there are, pro there are solutions that in fact are detrimental to you. It's better to end up with a different solution that happens to perform better out of sample. And that's what, that, that's what we showed in this, in this practical example in, in, in this paper. Why is this relevant? Well, there are many reasons why quantum computing is relevant and is going to change all of our lives. Number one is Feynman's observation. He was thinking in the context of physics. If you have a physics problem that is quantum mechanical, you shouldn't be using a deterministic machine to solve that problem. Well, in finance, it happens the same. In finance, we work with random variables. We don't know what are going to be the outcomes of various phenomena. And yet, we are using deterministic machines to solve probabilistic problems. It makes no sense. It's not the efficient way to do it. We should be using probabilistic machines that rather than simulate random variables, operate with the random variables. A second, I guess, more compelling argument is that Moore's law is finished. We have been living for the past 30 years an incredible era where computers became more and more powerful. But that's finished. Back in 2012, the number of transistors that you can buy per dollar has peaked. It's just that you cannot put more transistors 
you know, there, you need a few atoms in between the transistors. Physically, it's impossible to keep up. So what is going to happen? From now on, we are going to keep buying transistors that are a little bit, a little bit faster. It's going to cost us a lot of much more money, but they are going to be a little bit faster. And eventually, foundries will stop producing new microchips because the research costs will not pay for the profits, for the benefits. So the digital computing era is about to end. We need something to replace it. And right now, the best candidate is quantum computing. Uh, quantum computing, on the other hand, is it's at its dawn. It's just beginning. It's, it's something that, can, that holds the promise of given, giving us the computational power we need for artificial intelligence. I, I love the, when the previous speaker said, we have not seen artificial intelligence yet. I couldn't agree more. We have not seen artificial intelligence yet because we don't have the computing machinery that artificial intelligence needs. We are using Abacus to solve the kind of problems that machine learning and, uh, and deep net, uh, neural networks Artificial intelligence in general needs. We're using abacus. We need machines that can truly show us the potential of artificial intelligence. And here is the, I guess, the poetic aspect of it. Nobody really knows how a quantum computer works because this is quantum mechanics, right? As soon as you try to look into what is going to happen, what is happening in the system, you are perturbing the system and the system changes its state. So I think it's going to be very interesting when we recognize that in order to develop artificial intelligence, in fact, we need a kind of machinery that we don't truly understand. I guess it's happening already. We're using our brains and we don't truly understand how they, how they work. Well, the same we will have to do with quantum, uh, with quantum computers. We will have to use some machines to develop artificial intelligence where we don't actually understand how these machines truly work. Is this, this is uh, um, something that is um, very controversial. You will hear many experts that are opposed to use machinery that they don't truly understand every aspect of it, but as a matter of fact, it's showing results. And I welcome to the future. I hope you visit this website called quantumforquants.org. There is plenty of materials there. We have put it together a couple of weeks ago. It's an online community where we discuss various problems that are interesting in this area where these problems can provide true added value that is worth a fee and that is worth um, the effort that society is putting in, in these problems. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.